You are God's responsibility. The number one best-selling book of all times is the Bible. Theologians say that the most accurate version of the Bible is the new standardized version. There have currently been approximately 450 different translations of the Bible. And of those 450 different translations of the Bible, the most popular translation is the King James Version. In the King James Version, which is the most popular translated version of scripture, we have approximately 783,137 words. Over 700,000 words in the King James Version of the Bible. In this version of the Bible with this, these, these many words, there are oftentimes that we would see a certain word and any time we see that certain word, it would have the same meaning. Most times when we see a certain word, whether it's in the New Testament or the Old Testament, the definition, the meaning is the same. And there are often times when we see a certain word, we may not know the actual meaning of that word, Brother David, but what we would do is we would look at what is known as the law or the principle of first mention. And when we look at the principle of first mention, the first time it was mentioned in scripture that would give us what that word means. There are other times when we cannot find the word or the definition of the word and we can't look at the law or the principle of first mention. We have to look at the law of what we call expositional constancy. Expositional constancy simply says that look at the word and see how many times it is used in scripture. And when you see how many times it is used in scripture, what you would do is you would bring all of those times together to get the better understanding of that word. Here we see, for example, that there are times when we cannot use the law of principle or, or the principle of first mention or the law or the principle of expositional constancy. Sometimes we have to look at the original Greek and Hebrew of that word to understand what it means. What do you mean, Bolton? There's a word called power that's found in scripture. The word power is replete throughout scripture, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see the word power, we see the word power in the New Testament in Acts 1.8. We also see the word power in the New Testament in Matthew 28, verse 18. But here we see the same word that's not based off of a principle or a law. It is based off of the etymology or the origin of that word. So we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, the word power. We see in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the word power. The word power in Acts 1, 8, it's, it says, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Since that is in the New Testament, we look at the Greek derivative of that word. When we look at the Greek derivative of the word power, the Greek word for power in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is dunamin or dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamite from. And then we skip over a few chapters before that and we look at Matthew chapter 28 verse 18. We also says, and when Jesus says, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. But here is not dunamis, it's the Greek word exousios, which does not have to deal with dynamite. It has to deal with authority. And in our scripture today, we see where there's the same word, but a different meaning. 
In Genesis chapter one, verse one, the Bible says it this way. It says that in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word for created here is the Hebrew word bara. The Hebrew word bara comes from a Latin translation, which mean made out of nothing. But if you go further down in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, that same scripture says, and God created man. Now, God created man is not bara, which means to come out of nothing, because you understand in the scripture that it says he made man from the dust of the earth. So that Hebrew word is not bara. That Hebrew word is, in fact, asa which means to make from something that was already there. But with me giving you that introduction, whether God bara us, made us out of nothing, or whether God asa us, made us out of something, what you need to know, dear heart, is God is responsible for making us anyway. We are his responsibility. And a good thing about God and how he takes his responsibility, dear hearts, the good thing about him is God does not get things wrong. And God never makes any junk. He is responsible for the man or woman that he made. And I'm so glad, before I get too happy in this message, I'm so glad that God is responsible for me that he made me and that he would never leave me. Now I know, I know how some of you all could feel that your misfortunes, that your mistakes, that your mishaps can make you feel a certain way. But God says, I made you. And if you read this text, you will see that he not only made you, he knows you. And since he knows you, he knows the things that's in you. And since he knows the things that's in you, he will still never leave you. So I know how you can feel sometimes. I know how it can feel in your heart, how it can feel in your mind that sometimes you don't feel like you are enough. Sometimes you don't feel like you have a purpose, but don't rely, dear heart, on what you feel. Concentrate on what God said. And one of the first things he said, Deacon Pugh, if you're listening, praying for you, one of the first things that he said is that you were fearfully and wonderfully made that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. So David, in this particular text, he chose us as he's talking to the chief musician. He says, number one, that God fearfully made you. Did you hear me? That God, point one, fearfully made you. Now, Pastor Hager, that word fearfully does not imply to be afraid of. Brother David, it's more to be in awe of. So when you think of the making of man, you sit back and say, whoever did this and did it so well, they outdone themselves. For verse 13 says it this way. Don't get don't, don't miss this. Verse 13 says, God specifically knit you together. God specifically knit you together. You with your dark self. God specifically knit you together. James with your short self. God specifically knit you together. You with your sensitive self, God specifically knit you together. And the thought of being fearfully and wonderfully or fearfully made like this ought to cause you to move. It ought to generate some type of response to know that even if 
people don't love you, even if folks don't like you, God, who's responsible for you, loves you just the way you are. But Max Lucado said he refuses to leave you that way because ultimately he wants you to be just like him. But the thought of it ought to move you. In fact, dear heart, God gave you a cardiovascular system that gives you the energy to move, a muscular system that gives you the ability to move, an endocrine system that gives you or triggers you to move, an immune system that helps you move, and a digestive system that'll make you move. So God didn't make you or create you to sit there and soak air. That's not why he created you. He didn't just design you, but through life's idiosyncrasies, through life's infelicities, through life's mistakes, what he designs, he develops. And he develops you into something that he wants you to become. And life has a way of teaching you who you ought to be. Because God who designed you it's also the God who's developing you and the God who develops you now desires you. But not only do he desire you, he wants you to desire him too. So Ephesians 2 and 10 says that we are God's workmanship. Hear me closely. We, God's responsibility, we are his workmanship. And he prepared us before the foundation of this world. We are God's workmanship. He calls us a good work. And he did this, dear hearts, before the foundation of the world. Listen to me close. If you don't get anything I say in the next 10 minutes, get this. Since God, Jeremiah says, formed you in the before he formed you in the belly, he knew you. Hear me closely. Before you were a person, you were a purpose. And you had to come here because God put something in you to fulfill once you got here. So number one, God fearfully made us. But not only did God fearfully make us, number two, God wondrously shaped us. God wonderfully shaped us. Now, I know David in his penitential psalm, Psalm 51, says that we were shaping in iniquity. I know that's what he said. But understand the context, syntax, and index of that text. When he said that, it was a response to him sinning with Bathsheba. One thing that separates us from others is our heavenly and holy father. And the attribute that separates a regular father, hear me closely, from a holy father is the word holy. And Isaiah chapter 64 verse 8 says that we are clay made from the hand of a holy father. Did you hear me? We are clay made, Sister Betty Barnett, we are clay made from the hand, Steve, of a holy father and everything about our holy father is holy including his hand so if we are clay made from the hand of a holy father christy if we are clay made from the hand of a holy father an unholy thing does not come from his holy hand it is our life and the things that we experience that we go through that can make us unholy. But God says in Genesis chapter one, verse 26, that the first thing, the first thing God gave us before he gave us breath was his image. So if God was to ever take a selfie, it should look like us. Because he gave us his image. God invested time. In shaping and in, in shaping you, he invested time. He did not rush the process. It pleased God to shape you 
in the way that he did. That's why that verse, when, when it says it forms the, 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 the word that comes alongside is he fashioned us. In fact, in fact, to the point that when God created or made the world, it was only one time that he used a certain statement. When he made the sea, he said, that's good. When he made the earth, he said, that's good. When he made water, he said, that's good. But when he made you, the first and only time in scripture, he said, it's very good. So God is responsible for doing that. No wonder the theologian William uh, Paley said that God is the master designer. Your body right now has at least 10 trillion cells in it. Most of those cells are in your mind to govern how you act and how you think. But before you got those 10 trillion cells, dear heart, before you got those, you competed in your mother's womb with at least or up to 400 billion sperm cells. So 400 billion sperm cells competed to make you and you won out. So no matter how many times you feel defeated in this life, you came here a winner because you beat out at about 400 billion cells and you got here. So that's why you're here. You got a purpose and part of your responsibility on this life in this life is to fulfill that purpose. So you came here every time you wake up, you should wake up to win. But there are sometimes, there is sometimes, there are sometimes that although you came here a winner, that you would go from the winner's circle to the sinner's circle. There are times in our lives when we don't do what God told us to do. There are some times in our lives when we do do what he told us not to do. Those are what we call sins of commission and sins of omission. So my last point deals with this sinner versus winner that God is responsible for making. So not only did God fearfully make you, not only did God wonderfully shape you, but point number three, and I'm done, is God marvelously saved you. Because of our sin nature, our propensity to sin, sometimes we are not a winner. Sometimes, dear heart, we are a sinner. Titus 3 and 5 says that because of our sin, God had to save us. And if you look in verse number 14, the Bible says that although we are fearfully and wonderfully made or fearfully made, wonderfully shaped, it says later on, it says, and my soul knows quite well. Did y'all see that? It says, and my soul knows quite well. Most times you see in scripture, the word soul, it is often tied to salvation because that's what salvation does. Salvation has come to save your soul. So Titus three and five says it this way. Titus three and five says that God through Jesus had to save us. He counseled a debt we could not pay to handle a debt he did not owe. He saved us. So the word, the word says that my soul knoweth quite well. The word sinner is a word that is from the sport of archery. It is the Greek and Hebrew word hermatia or hermatio, which means to miss. So when these athletes were involved in archery, and they would pull back the arrow and it would miss its intended target, they were called a sinner. 
But when they were pulled back and they would hit their intended target, they were known as a winner. Now, most of us, if you be honest about the truth, most of us can identify with sinning and winning. And our soul, the Bible says it this way, the soul that sin shall surely die. It says that the wages of sin is death and there will never, ever be a reduction in those wages. But what happened since we miss the mark and death was the payment? The last part of that verse says what? My soul knows well of this awesome work in which you have done. That work that Jesus done or that work that's being referred to is salvation. So the Bible shows us that God has more salvation than we have sin. Now, I know. Hold up. Hold up. I know people are saying, well, Jesus did not come into, uh, until the New Testament. So, Brother Bolton, why are you talking about him saving in the Old Testament? Well, I'm glad you asked. If God is responsible for making you, he's also responsible for saving you. And Revelation 13, 8 says it this way. Behold the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Did y'all hear that? Before the, behold the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the earth. Now, I'm not saying that you existed before the foundation of the earth. He did. He didn't just get here. He been here before been here, got here. And once been here, leave here, he'll still be here. But he had to come here because he had already died for folks who would be here. A few years ago in 2015, and I'm done. In 2015, I was flying back and forth from Atlanta here. And I had become accustomed to a certain flight and a certain pilot on that flight. He had been flying way before I moved to Odessa. I think he had 30 years of flying experience. And since I had learned his flying techniques, there was one particular time. We were flying from Dallas to Odessa. There was a guy behind me and a few in front of me, and the pilot told us before we got on the plane to expect some turbulence. And when he told us to expect the turbulence, because I had a, an experience with him, because I had an experience with him, I was able to sit back in my seat and relax because he had been doing that all the time. Well, as we are getting to the air and they told us we were 35,000 feet in the air, the plane started dipping and curving and dipping and curving. And then the rain came. The gentleman that was in back of me said, oh, my goodness, I think we're about to die. Oh, my goodness, this is the end of our lives. But I sat there. Cool calm and collected because I had been on the plane with this pilot before. And so at the end of the flight, the idea came up. They said, they said, they said, they, they, they looked at me and said, man, this guy was so calm during the flight. Why were you so calm during the flight? I said, because this ain't the first time that this pilot got me to my destination safely. So as I'm walking towards to leave out of the cockpit area, I look at the pilot and I said, you don't remember me flying with you, but thank you for getting me to my destination safely. The pilot looked at me and said, sir, that's my responsibility. I've been doing this all the time. And that's the same thing that God is telling you. Regardless of your sin, your wrong, your wrongdoing, God has always piloted your life. And this ain't the first time that he's going to get you, the person he's responsible for making, to your destination safely. So the scripture ends by saying, I will praise you. I will praise you for your marvelous works. So the fact that you fearfully made me, the fact that you wonderfully shaped me, and then the fact that you marvelously saved me, that's your responsibility to me but God, my responsibility to you is to praise you. And I ask you all today, as I'm done, what if God only gave you tomorrow, but you praised him and thanked him for today? 
what would your tomorrow look like? It's his responsibility to make you, shape you, and save you. But the root word of responsibility is respond. How are you going to respond to him? My time is up, and I appreciate yours. Thank you.